Ooh, there we go. Y'all almost got last week's sermon again. I looked down and I was like, oh, Mark 3. And I had opened, I still had the notes in here from last week. And I looked and it went, we're not in Mark 3. And then I thought I wrote down the wrong text. I was like, I got nervous there for a moment. We are actually in Mark 8 this morning. It is page 819 and 820. And your Bible's there in the pews. If you are on a device, you can turn to the New International Version uh, of the Bible. We're in the NIV using that. Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. A short uh, passage, but nonetheless uh, an, an interesting story. And I've titled the message this morning on Seeing Clear. Clearly. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to teach, to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus said, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were open. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Let's pray. Father, thanks again for your word. Thank you that we can be in this place today to worship you. <clears throat> Father, so many times we come at places in our lives where we need clarity. So I pray this morning, if there be one here that needs clarity as to what's next, that you will teach us the principles from this story. And we'll thank you for it in your name. Amen. Did I, we, am I still on here? It, okay, I'm just making sure. Okay. Uh, anyway, I still remember where I was sitting in church when my pastor came up to me. It was a Sunday night, and he walked over, and he goes, Bobby, they all called me that. He said, I just need to let you know something before you hear it. And then he went on to tell me that a girl that I had gone to school with and then went to Liberty with and her and her husband had gotten married and we had all kind of hung out at Liberty for the year that I was there together. She died in a car accident. And they had been newly married. Uh, I found out later what happened. They were on their way home to Virginia, and they were on a winding road, and what happened was there was fog. If you've ever had to drive in fog, you have to drive with great care. But the problem is if you stop, somebody can rear end you. So you have to creep along. You can't, whatever you do, you can't stop. But you also know you can't see. If you've ever been in thick fog, you can't see in front of you. They were trying to go along at a clip. The fog set in. They hit a truck in front of them, and both her and her husband were ejected from the car. She, she died, but he survived. And, of course, going to that funeral was something else that I still think about it in my mind. You know, if you've ever been in a driving rain, if you've ever been in a blinding snow, if you've ever been in a, in a fog and you've tried to see in front of you, you're, the vision impaired is the worst thing in the world to have. If you've ever been in a situation where maybe you had great vision and now you're losing your vision or you've lost your vision, it is a, a place of darkness. We're dealing with that with a family member now. But I know even on a, on a little bit the lighter side, the older that I get, it's like I need to keep raising the, the percentage on these. You know, you keep going up now, it's like 125, and then it's 150, and it's 175, and then it's like, I always love when people, okay, can I borrow your glasses? And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, these aren't strong. And they go, whoa, and they can see better than me, and they're older than me, you know? It's always interesting. You know, and, and it's interesting because I can see, I can see at a distance pretty good, although my wife would debate that because she says I ride people's tails and she asked me if I could actually see. That's just because I'm a Florida driver. It has nothing to do with being able to see. But I will also tell you that I, up close now, when I try to get things in front of me, it's blurred. There's nothing like having blurry vision and you, you're trying to squint and all of that kinds of thing and, it, and it, it's difficult. So you have to put glasses on to be able to clear it up. Some people can see good from a distance. Some people can see good close up. If you've got 20-20 vision, you're truly blessed where you can see everything uh, you know, up close and you can see everything at a distance. Having, having your vision impaired is difficult. And sometimes we want to try to get clear. We would love to have that clarity and we need to have glasses on to do it. But you know, it's also true in life. So often I see people that are looking for clarity. You don't believe that's the case, just go through the Barnes and Noble or go on Amazon and look at motivational books and there are new ones coming out by the thousands it seems like every month. 
People will pay thousands of dollars to go to a Tony Robbins seminar to walk on fire to try to get clarity on their goals. They'll go see a business coach to get clarity on maybe how to function with their business, how to, how to carry it a little bit further, how to go to the next level. There is, there is so many times that we are looking for clarity. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you're looking for clarity in a relationship. Like, where do I go next? What's next for me in this relationship? Maybe it's, it's clarity in a project that you're working on. Maybe it's, it's clarity in, in, in what kind of ministry should you be involved in. Maybe it's clarity on what treatment do you take and what's next. Clarity is one of those things that we are often striving for, but it's so difficult to get because, because we don't know exactly how to do it. But see, in this particular text that we're going to look at today, it's very interesting because we actually learned some lessons about clarity that we're going to look at in a little bit. This, this uh, by the way, let me just give you a little bit of background and setting to this particular miracle. You know, last week we talked about the miracle that we referred to last week, that, that, or the, the, the situation in the story last week was in all three Gospels. This one isn't. This one is only in this gospel. That's it. Background is quite interesting and very, very instructive so that we understand the passage. Because if you read it, you can go past it and say, what in the world was he doing? Now, Jesus has just fed the 4,000. There were two different incidences where he fed 5,000 and then he fed 4,000. He just fed the 4,000. And as they are getting ready to go, the disciples, after Jesus fed everybody, they're, they're moving along and they're like, they get in the boats to leave and they're like, hey, uh, we forgot food. Jesus is like, really? Like, like we, we, I, I just fed, how many people did I just feed with these loaves and these fish? Really? You're worried that we don't have any food now? I just, I just did this. And he says, don't you have ears, in verse 18, he says, don't you have ears to see, or you know, ears to hear and eyes to see? You, are you guys still not clear on who I am and then this situation happens so let's take a look at the story because there's some interesting things that you'll miss if you don't if you don't uh, look at it closely notice what happens they came to Bethsaida now notice and some people did you get that brought a blind man and notice what it says they said hey Jesus sub can you heal him no they brought the blind guy to Jesus and begged him to heal him. Now, that word in the Greek, you know what it means? The word begged in the Greek? It means begged. <laughs> it, it means they begged him. They were literally saying, Jesus, can you please heal this guy? Now, at no point do we see that this guy necessarily wanted healed. Maybe he had given up hope. Maybe he had been the blind guy by the side of the road, hoping that somebody was going to help him or throw some money towards him or, or something. But these people decided that they needed to pick him up and take him to Jesus. And so, on his behalf, they lead him because he can't see. And they lead him to this guy, Jesus, and they're begging him, please, Jesus, would you please heal this guy? He's been like this all of his life, baby. We, we don't know what's going on, but please, Jesus, please, 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 just this once, would you please heal him? We've heard about you. Now, remember, Jesus had done all miracles in all, all sorts of different places and in different ways, right? Sometimes somebody would come to him and say, hey, uh, uh, can you heal so-and-so? My, my son is sick. And Jesus would go, go back. He's fine. And then they'd go back and he was fine without ever touching them. Sometimes Jesus would, a leper would say, hey, Jesus, can you heal me? And he would say, okay, you're healed. Go show yourself to the priest. Remember, 10 of them went and, uh, and only one came back to thank Jesus, but he never touched them. Another time the leper came to Jesus and said, Jesus, would you heal me? And, and Jesus reached out and it said, and touched him and said, I will heal you. Now this one is really, I'm just going to tell you, weird. This is a really, really weird story. So they're begging him to heal him. And then I love what happens next. Watch. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Wait a minute. It's, like, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like they, they bring him, Jesus, Jesus, please, 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 would you heal him? Would you heal him? Please, would you do it? Jesus goes, okay, I got him from here. And he takes him and walks away with him. Literally leads him outside the village. Now, from what we could tell here, context, these people didn't follow. It was probably the disciples that were there because of the context of what was going on before. So here, here's Jesus like, they go, we, please, 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 please heal, heal him. I need, we need you to heal. And Jesus said, all right, I got it. I'll take it from here. And boom, outside the city he goes, outside the village. So he gets him out there. <coughs> 
and it says, when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? Now, I, I don't know about you, but if somebody had taken me to this guy to be healed, they walked away with me outside the village, and then they spit in my eyes, I'd be going, uh, somebody come help me now. Now, what we're unsure about, the way this reads in the NIV, is did Jesus literally go, pff, pff, like that, and spit in his eyes, or did he spit in his hands, and then put his hands on him, which kind of may be the indication. Now, it, it, but either way, that's gross. Right? I mean, either way, you know, if you came to me and said, would you pray with me? And I went, <laughs> you know, here, I'm not going to anoint you with oil. I'm going to spit on you. Right? That's kind of weird. Now, again, it's important to understand the history, the geography, the context, and all of that. To some people in this time, spittle had healing properties. So I have to wonder if this guy, maybe Jesus was starting where he was at. Because, now, let me ask, by the way, let me ask you a question. If you don't think that we sometimes will try to, how many, what's the first thing you do if you don't have any water and you cut yourself? Anybody do what I do? Huh? Do you burn yourself? What do you do? Anybody go, like that. Okay? So, well, I, you, yeah, some may wipe it and some go, <laughs> I know. Some of you are going, okay, he's really sick. So this is right up his alley. But, 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 but the, the point of it is, is that they look at this and it's, and it's, and, and so he's probably, he's probably starting where the guy is at. Maybe the guy believed this. There's a good chance that he did. So Jesus starts where he is. So he creates the spit and whether he's, you know, creating the clay out of it or what, what, whether he literally spits in his eyes, it didn't necessarily alarm the guy. It alarms us, obviously, you know, but I, it would be kind of like, uh, you know, uh, t there are some people that still believe that, that uh, the oil from uh, anointing people with oil works. Now, there are healing properties certainly in oil, but so... But I'm, don't worry, I'm not, if next time, if, you're, if, you need, if you need to be anointed with oil, I'm not going to spit on you, just, just so you know. I don't anoint with oil either, because every time I have, the person's died. So I stay away from the oil, so just so you know. So anyway, he put his hands on him, and Jesus said, do you see anything? Do you see anything? And the guy looked up, and he said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. What? Whoa, 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 time out. Another little turn from the miracle. When Jesus said to a dead person, get up, they got up. When Jesus said to a person, be healed, they were healed. Jesus uses the spit and his fingers and he goes, what do you see? The guy says, I see people like trees walking. In other words, what he saw was sort of this blur. It was almost like a, a myopic sort of, if you, again, have glasses and you have trouble reading up close, I actually have that astigmatism, which means that I, I see like double. So I, I can't read unless the print is really large or unless I've got my glasses on. So he's kind of looking, and his, he can see that there are people that are there, but they look more like trees to him, so it's not clear. He's got blurred vision. Now the question is, did, did Jesus, was Jesus losing a little bit of his power? Was he losing a little bit of his, you know, his, uh, you know, his, 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 his power here to be able to heal people? I mean, what was he doing? Why could he heal him the first time out? You would think if it's Jesus, you heal him the first time out. I don't think Jesus was doing this to teach this guy anything as much as he was doing it to show the disciples something. Because those were the people that he saw as trees walking. Because Jesus led him outside the village, and I'm sure the disciples followed, but Jesus likes it. I, I've got this, I'll take this from here. So he takes him out, and the disciples are watching all of this happen. And Jesus is not has not healed him the first time. He says, I see, I see people as trees walking around. And then it says, once Jesus put his hands back on the man's eyes, he said to him, what happened? Then his eyes were what? Open. And his sight was restored. Watch this. And he what? And he saw what? Everything. 
thing. This guy had 20-20 vision, bam, just like that. Now, quite interesting. Now he can see. No, no conversation other than I see people like, like what, do you see? what do you see? And then, and then he says, he, he sees everything clearly. Now watch verse 26. Jesus sent him home saying, are you ready? Don't even go into the village. Now I looked at that and I thought, well, that's bizarre. They went through the village. The people brought him brought him from the village to Jesus. Jesus takes him by the hand and takes him outside the village and says, listen, go back to your house. Don't go back to the village. Don't go back to where the people brought you from. Now, this is quite an interesting story because again, the contextually, you have to understand it and what's going on before. I believe, yes, Jesus healed this guy. The story is true. And I believe he did it to teach the disciples a lesson. Because remember what happened with the disciples. It took some of them until the resurrection to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. They watched him raise the dead. They watched him heal people. They watched him do miracle after miracle after miracle. They watched him feed 5,000. They watched him feed 4,000. They watched it happen continuously. And some of them did not believe until after the resurrection. So what are the lessons here? I'm going to give you three lessons real quick. And we're going to come back and look at these. Now, three lessons about clarity. And for those of you that like points, you've got them this morning. And there's three traditional Baptist points. Are you ready? Number one, I want you to notice uh, here first that clarity is participatory. Clarity is participatory. <clears throat> in, in other words, for them to be able to see, this guy needed people to bring him to Jesus. Isn't that true? We need people in our lives often to help us see what we can't. We need people that are going to provide that for us. You can't see it alone. You know, when we think we have these eureka moments of clarity, it's all been brewing for a long time. But how many times, as I said earlier, do we go and we see a business coach? Do we go and talk to a pastor? Do we go and talk to an advisor, to a friend, to a counselor who are trying to help us provide clarity because we can't do it alone? I love, there's, there's two verses that I, I, I was looking at, and you can look at these later, but Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now listen to this, but fools to surprise wisdom and instruction. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise that wisdom and instruction, that, that carrying along by someone else. And then I love this, Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but listen to this, but with many advisors, talking about wise advisors, they, they will succeed. In other words, when we need clarity, we need other people. We need wise people that are going to be around us that are going to help us. And so it was so cool because these guys were like, hey, Jesus can help him. He needs his vision restored. He needs to be healed. Jesus can help him. And it took a whole group of them to take him to Jesus and to say, please, would you please do something for him? When the guy couldn't even do it on his own. You and I can't do it alone. Whatever you're trying to get clarity on in your life right now, you can't do it alone. We were never meant to walk this path alone. If it's clarity in a relationship, you can't do it alone. If it's clarity in your business, you can't do it alone. If it's clarity in, 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 in trying to determine what your spiritual gift is, your ministry, you can't do it alone. If it's clarity for the future, for college, for graduate school, for a job, you can't do it alone. You've got to have other people that can help you get to that point. I have a, a friend at the gym who, um, he has basically been involved in AA for I don't know how many years. <clears throat> He's been both clean and sober and he has led so many guys. It's taken other men and met them where they're at and literally sometimes dragged them to AA. And we talk, uh, we've talked about this a lot. In fact, I told him sometime, I think I want him to come and just give his testimony and take the service because he's got an incredible testimony about what God's done in his life and how God has used that to get other people. But he says, sometimes, you know, he says, they, they, they can't do it alone. He says, when you get to that point, oh yeah, you, you admit that God is your higher power, but God brings other people into your life to help you walk alongside of you. We have to have people that can help us. If you're trying to get clarity, remember that clarity is participatory and you've got to get help. You need other people. That's why we need the church. Look, folks, I could go on a boat today and worship God. 
you know? I may not catch any fish, but I could worship God. You know, I could, I could go out into the forest and the woods and I could worship God. I could do all of that. But we need people in our lives. When we, when we come here and we just come to church and we don't have a sense of community that we need one another, where we're trying to invest in one another and we're trying to be there for one another, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be that community that can be able to help one another. So clarity is first and foremost participatory. Secondly, I want you to notice this, that clarity, what we see here, is particular. Now, here's a problem that happens with a lot of folks. We look at somebody else's path and we go, hmm, I want to be on that path. We look at what God's doing in somebody else's life and we say, I wonder why that's not happening to me. I wonder why I can't do that. I, wonder, I, I want to go over and try that. Now, this, in, in this particular situation, this was unique to this individual. God chose to heal him at that moment in that way for whatever reason that he chose to do it. What, it was his own uniqueness and his own way and purpose in doing it. Let me tell you something. God has a particular path for you. It's not my path. It's not somebody else's path. It is your path. That's why I love Hebrews 12 when it talks about that we have to run with endurance the race that is set out before us. When you think about it, if we all were going to try to get to the mountains of North Carolina, let's say we were going to go to uh, Maggie Valley, North Carolina. Love Maggie Valley. Uh, been there several times and beautiful place. But if we plugged in the GPS, my GPS, if I go, will actually give me three different ways to get there. So it will take a lot longer. Some will, uh, some will give me a more direct route and I'll have to pay tolls. But even if you and I take the same route, we follow the same path. Way says, no, you want to go this way, this way, this way, this way. My journey is going to be different than your journey because I'm going to make different stops. Because I'm going to notice different things. Because I'm going to meet different people. Because all of these different things are going to happen to me along the way. My path will be different than your path, even though we may be heading in the same direction. So... In this particular situation, you have to understand that God is going to give you clarity that will be particularly based on what he wants you to do in that situation. And what somebody else has done in the situation may not be the same thing that he wants you to do. He's going to provide clarity in a different way for you at that moment. You get people to help you, but then he says, here's what I want you to do. And it's like, it's like they, bring you, they bring you the stuff and then Jesus says, you know what? I'll take it from here. I will take it from here. I got this. I got this. So it's particular. Now, there's one more thing. <clears throat> Not only is clarity participatory and particular, but we already talked about this a little bit. I want to spend a second here. Clarity is also progressive. Why is it do we think that we suddenly, we, we think, oh, I got clarity, that's it. But, it. but when you finally see that, it has been maybe hours and days of a thought process that has gone on and, all, and you've talked to people all of a sudden, bam, there's the answer. It happens with me on messages and it drives me absolutely bonkers. I will read and research and study and think. You'll even see, my, see me talking to myself in the car. You know, it's easier to do that now because people think you're on the phone. It's really great now. They think you're on the phone. But I may actually be talking out something and go, oh, that's it. And suddenly, everything that I've been studying, been researching, been thinking about, all of a sudden comes in one moment. And it seems like, Eureka, there it was. But it was maybe been, had been hours of thought has gone into it. Clarity never happens all at once. It may seem like it does, but it's a progressive thing. And that's what was going on with the disciples. Let me tell you what. We, we all have a past that we deal with. We all, we all have stuff that's back here. And this guy had a past and Jesus took, the people brought him to Jesus and then Jesus took him here and then he said to him though, which is really interesting, what, he, what was his instruction at the end? Don't go back to the village. Now listen, really important, really important lesson when you're trying to progress. The people that walked with you to here will likely not be the people that are gonna take you here. The people that met you over here, that brought you here, Jesus, when you finally get clarity, is gonna say, you can't go back you got to go forward. You can't go back because this is part of your past. But what a, what a lot of us do with the past is we let it consume us. 
the past consumes us. And, we, and, and, I, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to therapy to deal with your past. All of that stuff is important. But past should provide context. Once we understand the context of why we've done what we've done, we can change where we need to go. But please understand that the people that brought you and got you here may not be the people that are going to be walking with you over here. That's why Jesus said, don't go back. Go back to your home, but don't go back to the village because everything has now changed. You are now, now no longer seeing with blurred vision. You are now seeing with incredible clarity. It's almost like, it's almost like now... You can see, and in fact, the way the Greek reads is that you can see clearly and at a, he says, I can see clearly and at a distance. It's, it's interesting. I can, in other words, I can see the road that I'm supposed to be on. I, the fog has lifted and I'm no longer just going very, very slow, but I can see the path in front of me. I can see the winding road. I've got clarity of where I need to go. And Jesus is like, go, You're there. don't go back there. Don't hang out back there. Keep on going. Clarity is a tough thing because here's the thing. Once you get it, you can't go back. Once you get that clarity, it's time to move ahead. Once you have that clarity, it's like it's the key to experiencing God's best for you. In fact, that's a very good way to put it. That, that when I have clarity, it's the key to experiencing God's best for me. Clarity is a key to experience God's best for me. Clarity is that thing that I need for me to experience all that God has for me. Y'all remember those, uh, and they still have them now. You'll see them on the internet. But I remember when they first came out before we had the internet, we, we had those, those different books, I mean, entire books of 3D images, you know, and they, they would have like these lines and they would have to tell you in it that there were swimming dolphins or something like that, you know, where there was a desert landscape. And I remember people would give them to me and I would, I would look at it and all I would see is just the dots, just... They say you have to take it up to your nose and then you got to bring it back and you got to try to look through it. And finally though, when, if you're able to look beyond those squiggly lines, you see this beautiful picture. Maybe it's turtles. Maybe it's a desert landscape. Maybe it's the ocean. But you get clarity when you're able to look past all of the little dots that make no sense. You may be right there right now where all you see is a page that's got a bunch of dots, a mess, that you can't see anything that's in front of you. But God has taught us in this story that if we will just understand that we need other people to help us with that clarity, that it's going to be a process that we're going to have to go through. And to make sure that, that as we are moving along, that we are trusting him. Because we have to remember that clarity is the key to experiencing God's best for me. Let's pray.